Good evening, everyone. So public education in the United States has been around since about the mid-1800s. It's relatively new, and because of that, we're still trying to figure it out. There's not really anything that's more complex than when you're dealing with people, especially teenagers. Each one of them unique, with their own set of strengths, weaknesses, likes, dislikes, interests, and circumstances that are outside of anybody's control. And that makes teaching them pretty difficult. It's often said in education circles that teachers make more decisions minute to minute than brain surgeons do. Now, we'll put aside the immediate life and death urgency, which is a, <laughs> admittedly a pretty big part of that, and take it for the statement that it is. Teaching is pretty difficult, and we're constantly changing the things that we're doing, the ways that we're trying to engage our students. Day by day, lesson by lesson, class by class, and student by student. We're trying to revamp the ways that we connect with them in order to help them understand the world around them just a little bit better. But again, it's been around since the 1800s, and in that time, the structure really hasn't changed all that much. If we think back to the mid-1800s, you've got one-room schoolhouses with a teacher standing in front of a room full of students, a mixed bag, right? You have students that are young, old, learning math, or maybe whatever, time, whatever kind of science there was back then, right? But you have them all learning the same, in the same building. You fast forward to today, and not much has changed. It's still one person in front of a room sharing information that's deemed important. The only thing that's really changed is that classes have gotten bigger and we've divided them by grade level and subject and really that's more of a development of technology than it is in education, right? We have buildings that can have electricity and internet and air conditioning and all of that and we can comfortably house thousands of people in the same building like we couldn't do in the 1800s. We compare that to the developments in other fields, you know, for example, medicine since that time. Back in the mid-1800s, we had traveling snake oil salesmen selling cure-all oils from town to town. Now, you can buy them in fancy stores and they're called essential. <laughs> but, <laughs> in all seriousness, right, last year my dad had open heart surgery and he was up and walking two days later. Right, so comparatively, education is still kind of in the Stone Age. So we need to change the way that we view education. And if you've gone to school in the United States within the past 150 to 175 years, which I'm going to make and weep and say that most of us have, then you will agree that science education generally follows these steps. So step one, the teacher gets in front of a class and lectures for two, three, maybe four at most lab uh, periods where they are sharing the important information with their students, concepts, vocabulary, equations, practice problems, all of that in order to have their students know what information is important to memorize in order to ace a test that's coming in a couple weeks. Step two, we do some practice problems, we answer some conceptual questions, we make sure that we've memorized the vocabulary. But all of these steps, we're not really doing much thinking, we're just making sure that we remember the information that has been given to us. Step three, we do some type of lab. You know, we might uh, follow a set of procedures that are generated by the teacher, and we'll collect some data, put some numbers into a pretty data table, make a nice graph, and not really do much thinking, but turn it in, and then move on to step four, which is the formal assessment, a test, right? Multiple choice, true, false, open-ended questions, you know the gist, right? At, none of, at no point in these steps did students act like scientists or engineers, right? They didn't collect evidence on their own that they deemed important. They didn't create their own set of procedures. They didn't argue from evidence. They didn't really think. They were passive participants in their own learning. In order to truly understand something, if there's anything we know is that we need to be actively participating in the things that we're learning. So I propose that it's time to move away from an acquisition of information model in education and move towards something that's more of an, app an application model within education. So to demonstrate this need, I'm going to use a popular example, one that's kind of become a meme, right? If I were to ask you, what is the mitochondria? What would you say? Yeah, right, it's the powerhouse of the cell, right? So, so I can say that we have definitely memorized that information. We have acquired it. But can we argue that we understand that information? Can we apply it to different aspects of our life that may be very important? And I think the answer to that question isn't as cut and dry. So if instead we were to frame the study of the mitochondria within a real-world application, 
If I, were to, if I were a bio teacher and I asked my students, go look into the symptoms of mitochondrial decline, they're going to come back to me and they're going to say, there are developmental disorders, there's muscle regression, there's lethargy, there's lack of energy, there are all these things that affect the body, all of these symptoms. And those observations, that research that students do, can lead us into our investigation of the way that cells work. What process happens within the mitochondria that provides energy for the body? So students still need to understand that within the mitochondria, ADP, adenosine diphosphate, di is two, right, is turned into adenosine triphosphate, tri is three, right? And that's a high energy molecule that our bodies can use as energy. And, you know, it's good to know that, but can we apply it, right? So then we move forward and we say, okay, are there any uh, treatments that are being researched? Are there any treatments that are out there? What part of that process do these treatments actually target? Can we take what we know and apply it to the real world situation? So to get me a little bit more comfortable, I'll move into physics, right? And we'll talk about uh, how do we actually pedagogically do this in the classroom. So we can use something that's called a 5E model of education. So the first E, engage. Let's say that we are in a physics classroom and we are studying motion, kinematics. It's generally the first unit that a physics class will complete. We study how objects are moving and how we describe that they're moving. So maybe I'll show students some phenomena. I engage them by showing them a video of a Tesla driving itself. And I ask them, what information does a Tesla need in order to successfully navigate a road? So students might come back to me with observations and questions like, we need to know how fast the car is moving, how far it needs to go down the road, where the other cars are, how fast the other cars are moving. All of these things can be used, again, to bring us into the second E, explore. So students take these questions that they've generated for themselves, and they develop some steps, some experiments of their own, to develop the concepts, the models, the equations, the definitions that otherwise would have just been given to them by the teacher. The third E, explore, I'm sorry, expand. In this E, we take our, uh, I'm sorry, explain. In this step, we explain uh, how those kinematics apply to real-world situations? How can we use our models for distance displacement, speed, velocity, and acceleration, and use them to describe the world around us? In the next step, we move on to expanding. So can we take what we've learned from the kinematics that we've done so far and apply them to how does the Tesla drive itself? Or maybe, how does NASA use kinematics with a DART mission in order to send a rocket out to successfully hit a, a meteor that is on a collision course with Earth? Right? How does NASA make sure that both of those objects are at the same point in time in space? Right? So how do we take the knowledge that we've done in class and apply it to real-world issues that our students are facing? And finally, step five, we evaluate our knowledge. We figure out what have we learned. Where can we go from here? What do we do when we uh, move into the next unit? Can we use this information and then bring it forward with us? It requires that students are able to figure out what they've learned and how well they've learned it and maybe what other steps they need to take in order to move forward with that information. In this step, the teacher will also evaluate students by giving them some type of formal test quiz, something like that, but it's still meaningful. It should be application of knowledge as opposed to just the acquisition of it. No one's paying an engineer to reinvent the wheel, right? Why is it that I should have my students memorize the kinematic equations when everything's available to them almost instantaneously? Remember when your teachers used to tell you, you need to memorize your multiplication tables because you're not always going to have a calculator with you. Right? Now you have your cell phone. And it's not only a calculator, but it is you know, internet, it is a GPS, and it can tell you the fastest way to get a you know, cup of coffee from Starbucks. Right? So why is it important that my students need to memorize information that they can look up instantaneously? It's not. We need to move towards an application model within education. But changing the way that we teach in the classroom is only part of the issue. We also need to change the way that we view education and educators in general within the United States. 
And to demonstrate this need, I want to talk about two quotes that I've heard countless times since I graduated from college. The first one, those who can't do, teach. Right? I'm sure you've heard that statement before, and no matter how many times I've heard it, it still has the same effect. It's belittling, it's demeaning. It diminishes the teacher's job as just the person who couldn't do what they were supposed to do. Right? It's like taking a coach's position and just saying they're the person that couldn't play the game. But if you ask Tom Brady where he'd be without Bill Belichick, I doubt he'd say he'd get very far. And Bill Belichick never played a single day in the NFL. The other quote that I heard countless times is, Matt, you are so good at math, so good at science, you're so smart. Why do you want to be a teacher? Right? Why do you want to go into education? You can make so much money becoming a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, a scientist, research, whatever it is. Why are you going into education? And my response to that was kind of twofold. So first, isn't that kind of the point? Right? Don't we want the best and brightest of us, the ones that understand things the, the most, being the ones that are educating the future scientists, doctors, lawyers, singers, songwriters, artists? Don't we want that moving into the next era? We want our teachers to understand things, to be able to take their knowledge and improve the world with it. The other aspect of it was that, you know, sure, I was good at math and science. I was able to memorize the information. But it wasn't until I got to college that I realized I really didn't understand it. See, I changed my major my sophomore year from engineering into education because I realized that I needed to teach myself. And it was that journey of figuring out how I understand information that led me to figuring out how is it best that we can teach the future generation. And so it was a final push that I needed. So that's why. So if we can do all of this, if we can change the way that we teach, if we can change the way that we view education, if we can change the way that we treat educators and treat them with respect and take away the countless standardized tests that keep on telling us that our students are struggling, we don't need that. What we need is to be trusted and be given the, the professional freedoms to do what we know works best in our classrooms. And if we can do all of that, then education and the next era is going to look a lot brighter for all of us. Thank you.